Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's um, webinar. It's the first in our new series actually. We did, we did many of these webinars last year and the year before, um, just covering some CPD, some revision. Um, and tonight I'm absolutely delighted that um, we are here looking at this new volcano um, that started erupting around about a year ago now um, on the Rakens Peninsula called Fagrazalsfjall. Um, and actually the, the actual volcano itself doesn't have a name yet, um, but it, the mountainous area behind it um, is called um, Fagradalsvjall, and it's known locally as the People's Volcano. Just to give you some background, uh, my name's Karen, I work for Discover the World Education. Um, prior to working for Discover the World, I was a Head of Geography and Pastoral Deputy. Um, took a little bit of sabbatical about five years ago um, and went over to Iceland, trained as an Icelandic guide. Um, and now I work with Discover the World Education, looking at the um, itineraries and guiding school trips, as well as offering our free CPD service. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. And hopefully we can go through this um, new case study. Um, I can give you lots and lots of information about this particular volcano, um, as well as looking at the tectonic setting of Iceland, the location of the volcano, quite a detailed timeline, um, looking at the impacts and effects both in the short term and the long term. Um, and whilst we're going through that time, your, timeline, you'll notice um, that we're adding quite a lot of links to do with the planning, the preparation, the precaution, and the monitoring that went on prior to and during this actual eruption, and then look at more detail, some of the continued monitoring, preparation, planning, and precautions. I'm going to give you lots of resources that are available to support you in the classroom. Um, as I said, you know, the volcano is still unnamed, um, but um, you know, hopefully they will they will give it a name, a name soon. I'm going to turn off my video so that you can actually see some of the images um, a little bit better. You, um, I'll be here, but my colleague Pam is also with me. Um, she'll be monitoring the chat box. Um, hopefully we'll cover any questions um, that we have. But if you do have any questions, then please don't hesitate to email me um, and you'll be able to find my address through the Discover the World Education website. Um, or if not, you can email, email me directly. Um, it's karen at discover-education.co.uk, but I'll give you that information um, at the end. Okay, so let's let's start then. So Iceland is, a, is an HIC, it's a high income country. Um, since the island was permanently settled around the year 874, its population has worked really hard to overcome some of the hurdles, which is presented by its isolated location in the North Atlantic Ocean. It has a relatively harsh climate, and it also has lots of challenges posed by its very dynamic landscape. Iceland's high levels of education, technology, wealth and health mean that strategies to monitor, predict and take precaution against natural hazards are as advanced here as just about anywhere else on Earth. And it shows why this volcano has provided invaluable learning and education for not only the population of Iceland, but also to scientists, geologists and those who are just absolutely fascinated by volcanoes all over the world. So firstly, let's look at Iceland's tectonic setting. So Iceland is located in the North Atlantic Ocean, situated to the northwest of the UK. It takes around about two, two and a half hours um, to get there from the UK. In this map, which shows part of the world's land and oceans, you can see the mid-Atlantic ridge zigzagging right the way down the Atlantic Ocean from north to south. Iceland is one of the only few areas where on this line, it pops up above the ocean, and it is the biggest of those islands. This map also shows lots of red dots clustered around Iceland and other locations that are near the plate margins. And these are the most significant areas of volcanic activity, past and present. As you can see, the distribution often occurs in belts aligned with the margins or boundaries between the plates. To the west of Iceland, we see the North American plate that USA and Canada are part of, and to the east, the Eurasian plate, which includes the UK and the rest of Europe. In this mid-Atlantic zone, the plates are moving apart 
divergent plate margin. So we see the spreading and separating of the crust. This diagram represents the activity beneath Iceland really well. The Earth's crust is the thin layer of solid rock that we live on. Before you get down to the deep zone, soft or semi-molten hot rock below called the mantle. The crust in places like the UK is typically about 40 to 70 kilometres thick. It's a nice continental crust. The crust on the Rakens Peninsula, which is where this volcano is happening, is only six kilometres thick. So around about a tenth of the actual thickness, but it's much denser, thinner oceanic crust. Therefore, hot rocks from the mantle are never far away from the surface. The thin crust here is quite brittle and due to the convection currents, upswelling of magma takes place in the mantle plume beneath Iceland. This surge of energy from deep towards the Earth's core has created a hotspot of stronger volcanic activity that has created Iceland, starting from the ocean floor and gradually building up. Volcanic activity at divergent or constructive plate margins is not usually explosive, although we will see that we did have some magma plumes on this particular volcano later on. And magma chambers don't usually build up under high pressure with rigid crust, but instead there are small pockets of lava that move, rise and sometimes join together, encouraged by the earthquake activity creating new paths for it. In the southwest of the map, I've labelled the Rakens Peninsula, the area of the country which is the focus of our case study, and literally is the location of the focus of tens of thousands of earthquakes in the first few weeks of 2021. We can decipher information about the Icelandic landscape from this map, which shows relief, the height and shape of the land. The island of Iceland is not very much different, actually, in the size to the nation of, of England. It's about three quarters of the land area or just about half of the whole of the UK. But as you can probably gather, the landscape is very, very different. I know we haven't really included a key on this, but obviously the brown areas show the highland areas. The white areas show the ice caps and 10% of Iceland is covered with ice. Most of the glaciers aren't valley glaciers, which extend like long tongues down the valley, but actually they're ice caps, which totally smother the land beneath it. There are also countless rivers in Iceland, which make their way to the inner highland, to the rugged coastland, coastline, and the coastline has a jagged tooth-like appearance with lots of fields reaching inland like narrow fingers. So let's connect the location of Iceland to tectonic theory. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge runs right through the country, as you can see, see here, labelled with the red zones. The plate margin isn't a nice, tidy, straight line. It's a jagged, a messy line. I always used to call it when I was teaching a bit of a fuzzy boundary. Um, parts of the crust get stuck against the semi-molten mantle and different areas move slightly faster than other. You can see that the ridge splits into two different zones in southern Iceland. Throughout this zone, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge has caused so much volcanic activity that volcanoes have grown over millions of years until Iceland broke through the ocean surface, creating new land. And this continues to grow to this day as the plates move around about two to four centimetres each year. You can see the capital area of the city of Reykjavik. It's the northernmost capital in the world. Um, and near the tip of the peninsula, you can see Keflavik Airport. And if you've been to Iceland, this will have been the airport that you would have gone into. There is a scale on this map, but to give you a sense of size, it takes about 45 minutes, with the roads being good and, and not much wind or snow or ice, to drive from the airport to the capital. The thin crust gets tugged and cracked by the convection from the mantle below. And what happens when the Earth's skin gets stretched and expanded? Well, there are fractures, breakages, fissures, you could say stretch marks. And on the map, you can see evidence of this in Rakens when we look at the location of the peninsula's volcanic zones. There are six distinct stripes on the map, broadly parallel with the plate margin. And these are the volcanoes that have erupted lava that have created this particular land.
Now, when you drive along the Rakens Peninsula, most of the rock you can see on the surface has only existed for around about 10,000 years. It's funny, when, I, when I'm guiding students and I talk about, you know, they've only been here a, a, a few hundred million years and, and they kind of think, oh my goodness, you know, um, but 10,000 years these have been here, whereas the UK have been there for hundreds of millions of years. It's difficult, isn't it, to, to explain this to students um, because the sense of time is, is, is really hard. But around about 6,000 years ago, a period of effusive eruptions created a shallow shield volcano which features on the Rakens. And these eruptions must have lasted for some time to create these broad lava fields. So let's start to look at the tectonic timeline. Locally, the earthquakes corresponding with the movement of magma up within the crust were causing minor damage. You can see here from, from this photograph of the road um, on the 16th of March. The southern coast road is only four kilometres from the southern end of the dike and crosses multiple volcanic zones. Some road shudders had 15 centimetres to almost 30 centimetre drops appearing overnight, requiring assessment and some infilling, and the narrowing of lanes along this main road and reduced speed limits were put in for safety. There was a little bit of level of concern that the eruption could reach the town of Grindavik, which you can see quite clearly here on our map. Um, Grindavik being here, and um, or if not, it could actually harm the South Coast Road. So the authorities contacted all businesses in the region who had access to bulldozers and other earth moving equipment, so that in the event of an eruption, the soil and rock on the ground could be piled into artificial levees barriers to help slow or divert flowing magma if it threatens settlement or infrastructure. So you can already see from here, even sort of like before the eruption began, they started putting some planning and some precautions alongside the monitoring in place. Risk assessment of the South Coast Road led to it being closed actually just two days later on the 18th of March. There was some previous damage and they were worried about very heavy rainfall and they thought that that might cause some slipping or slumping of the slopes either side of the the road. There was quite a few large tremors leading up to this, um, but actually on the 16th to the 18th of March, there were hardly any significant tremors. And we wondered at this particular point, and the Icelandic authorities had some discussions, you know, was that it? Um, had we had quite a few earthquakes? Um, were we panicking over nothing? Had this damage happened? And was it a sign that the active period was over? Iceland does get quite a lot of earthquakes all the time, usually minor ones and not so many sort of like that are showing magmatic activity. So they did wonder whether or not this was the end of it. However, on the evening of Friday the 19th of March 2021, reports emerged from multiple sources of a possible volcanic eruption. The Met Office issued a notice of possible eruption about nine o'clock and before 10 o'clock, they and the Civil Protection Authority confirmed an eruption was underway. They reckoned that its timing was around about 8.45 p.m. Now, these pictures were taken from the roads along the north and south coast of the peninsula and images had been posted on social media of this very impressive glow in the dark sky. The Coast Guard's helicopter was deployed towards the volcanic glow and there was a small crew, including Christian Jones Dottier, who is the head of the Natural Hazard Monitoring Centre at the Met Office. This photograph was taken from that first flight, so you can see how significant this eruption was becoming. And this was literally within a couple of hours. It shows a fissure running for a length of around about 500 metres, which had emerged from the ground underneath the southern end of the dike that had been forming in recent days, just east of the Fagrasada Ridge. The eruption took place in a valley called Geldingadala, and I've marked Geldingadala um, with a right, white triangle on the map here. Now, special news programmes began on TV and radio. The national broadcaster, RUV, later spoke with an eyewitness from the nearest town, Grindavik, who was absolutely mesmerised by the events on the horizon that Friday night. 
The image to the right is a screenshot from the website um, called Air Comid Eldgos, and I'm really sorry about my Icelandic pronunciation, but it's been a recent viral hit in Iceland, and Eldgos means volcanic eruption. Now, this was created by a very clever social media management company called Sahara, who's used it to gain publicity for their agency. The simple site had for some weeks just asked the question, has an eruption started? And simply the answer was no. But within moments of the eruption, that website changed to a yow, yes. But rather more importantly, the response of the authorities to ascertain the details of the eruption was underway. So what did they find? The Civil Protection Coordination Centre is a key connection point in situations like this. It is always poised to be activated in an emergency, such as when civil protection issue is an emergency phase response to a natural hazard. At this particular point, the severity and risks from an eruption are unclear, so the approach is to be rather safer than sorry. Precautions taken straight away included closing the main road to the airport, that's 12 kilometres to the north of the eruption site. And a code red was put in place um, in terms of the airspace immediately around the eruption. Now, this is really interesting because this is something that they didn't do straight away with the AF Leckley-Yerkler eruption. And if you remember with that particular eruption, flights um, around Iceland and beyond were actually disrupted for many, many days afterwards. But obviously the Volcanic um, Airways um, Centre, they, they do have sort of like tolerance levels as to what can happen in terms of flights. But the flights here had to keep away from the eruption local area unless it was a local aircraft, light aircraft or helicopters um, for scientists and researchers. There would not yet been the opportunity to measure whether or not there were dangerous gases or ash coming from the eruption. So settlements, settlements downwind of the eruption location were advised to keep windows closed just in case. The late night forecast of wind carrying um, gases on the currents or any light ash is shown on the map to the right. Um, and this was actually heading towards the coastal villages um, further east. The main road from Reykjavik to the airport was reopened actually quite quickly, um, literally within an hour or so, because it was determined that the level of threat was actually pretty minimal. And also people wanted to drive out from the capital area to the peninsula to see the glow. Um, you know, they could see it on TV and social media, but actually they wanted to see it from the south. So the road closure actually served just to dissuade people from doing that. Um, just while sort of like the circumstances were evaluated. You can see the graph here, which is taken from the website of the road authority, and they monitor traffic levels on the main road. And this shows that actually vehicles using that main road towards the airport, um, note how the day before, you know, the, the traffic sort of like ends with a smooth downward curve, yet on that Friday night, there's quite strong, strong spikes um, because people actually drove along that road because just to get a glimpse um, of this actually volcano. It was reported quite quickly that there was no volcanic ash, so it remains safe for those jets to fly in and out of the airport, which is about 20 kilometres from the eruption site. Um, the, the actual eruption was not considered an ash risk outside of the valley um, and a late sort of like arriving flight and departure to Warsaw actually just continued as per the schedule. What was of more concern actually was outside the localised area of the eruption um, and that was the risk of gas um, such as sulphur dioxide, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. And as well as the detailed reports coming in from gas monitoring stations around the peninsula, a website was promoted where public could report unusual gas smells, suspicious headaches, sore eyes or a sore throat that may be caused by the gases of one sort of another. And the authorities then continued to monitor this data to establish any patterns and risks. And actually, that still is happening now. So even like a year after the eruption, um, members of the public and, and local people are encouraged to do that. But it's not just the authorities, geographers and scientists that were excited about um, a new eruption. And two very famous Icelanders, um, you probably have heard of one of them, and obviously we, we know both, um, they actually sort of like offered expresses and quite 
sort of poetic responses to the news. The former president, Olafur Ragnar Grimson, puts the timescale in perspective. And Bjork, um, who's a lovely, quirky Icelandic um, performer, as you probably know, she describes nature as expressing herself and the joy that this actually does bring to the Icelanders. So on the 20th of March, the Coast Guard deployed again at first flight, and this photo was taken from that early morning flight. The eruption continued as a small, typical Icelandic type fissure eruption, steady effusive lava flow and no explosive activity. So therefore the authorities could reduce some of the alert levels and eliminate some immediate potential hazard scenarios as it didn't really pose a risk to the public. You know, the University of Iceland actually declared the eruption as, as having happened in an ideal location, saying that they can be assured that populated areas and infrastructure are not at any current risk. And in typical Icelandic um, way, he said, people can sleep soundly. Now, as you can see, the eruption is surrounded by hills, with Fagvalsjöldfjöld to the west, meaning mountain of the beautiful valley, and Story Hörta to the southeast, meaning Big Ram. Now, in the relief map on the right, you can see the shape of the land. The eruption site, laid, labelled on the slopes of Geldingadala, a valley. Effectively, there are three conjoined valleys. Now, the head of the natural hazards at the Met Office, Katrin Johns Dottier, spoke on the news that morning. And the headline of this article um, says that there was a forecast change in the wind direction that will send gases towards the capital city. Now, this forecast for the afternoon and evening meant that people should take the precaution of closing windows. The photo on the right shows PhD students from the University of Iceland who were heading to the area around the eruption sites to support the research and monitoring of the volcano. This group were installing more GPS equipment nearby to measure changes in the shape of the land. And for the public who may want to get a piece of the action, access to Gelding Adala was possible as the civil protection alert level had been reduced from emergency to alert. But visitors needed to be prepared and follow strict advice from civil protection and the rescue teams that were active in the area. And you can see some of the sort of like things that they had put in in place to follow with bullet points. Now, amongst one of the early um, arrivers to the site were actually some good friends of Discover the World and our lovely photographer here, Ragnar, he was aboard one of the very first craft flying over and landing at the site. And he captured some of the first professional images of the eruption from the air and ground. And these actually can be found on our website and within the resource pack that I'm going to share with you later. Now, his photography of the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in 2010 became renowned and aside from its beauty actually assisted scientists with their understanding of some of the phenomena going on at this time. Now this new eruption after 12 hours was now focused to a 180 meter length of activity, the fissure having evolved into three particularly active vents on one side of the valley and this picture really shows that. By the end of the day the area of lava was equivalent to 10 football pitches with a maximum depth of 10 metres covering the valley floor near the largest crater. And you can really see evidence of this from Ragnar's photograph here. The eruption in Gelding and Dala has fluctuating activity from hour to hour, but through Sunday 21st of March, the flow remained very steady between five and seven cubic metres per second of lava emerging from three active vents. To give you a sense of scale, this skip here holds six cubic metres, so the volcano would fill one of these every second. Now that sounds like a lot, but in volcanic standards, it's actually very small. Now, with reasonable weather and being a Sunday, it was anticipated that many people would visit the volcanic site on this day. And this was the case. And the rescue teams needed to provide assistance to over 100 people, all told, on Saturday evening and overnight. As some got too close, fell ill from concentrations of gas, some had underestimated the trek. It's not easy and actually weren't, well, you know, weren't prepared enough. Um, some people actually had to ring for help because they got lost and there wasn't an awful lot of signal in that particular area at that time. However, no major injuries have occurred.
Now, for much of the 22nd, visiting the site was actually prohibited due to poor weather, but essential work continued, including remote sensing from planes flown above for mapping. And in the photo on the right, you can see staff from the Met Office in full PPE because of the gas, carrying out research on the fringe of the lava flows in Gelding Adala. On Monday, three days after the start of the eruption, the first data analysis had already been taken. And it's no surprise from videos and photos to know that we have basalt block, low in silica content. What was newsworthy is the detail of its composition, looking at volcanic glass in the new rocks, and scientists can then judge where it has come from. Now, actually, I was very lucky and I managed to visit this particular site and the, the little bits of lava that I did bring home, um, they weren't from the lava. I didn't go on to the lava flows, obviously, but just from around the edge. And actually, they were just like glass. Um, so it's been fascinating, sort of like looking at the studies that have happened afterwards to see why this is the case. Now, we have now got sort of like um, some evidence and some hypothesis on this. And if magma gets trapped within a magma chamber or the supply of magma from the mantle is cut off, the different minerals will start to separate out. And this can be evidenced when an eruption happens. You'd also see a lot of evidence of minerals from the Earth's crust getting caught up in the lava if the magma has been trapped in the crust for any time. But with the lava from this eruption, there is not evidence of separating or minerals from the crust. The magma seemed to be straight from the mantle, as if there is a straightforward and uninterrupted flow from the vast reservoir of liquid rock below. This steady supply of lava would suggest that the eruption could last a long time, flowing slowly but steadily for perhaps months or even years, like Kilauea in Hawaii. Eruptions like this of effusive lava create shield volcanoes. They're not unusual in Iceland, actually. A famous example of a shield volcano is Skaldabreda, which is pictured here. This is a typical shield volcano with slopes of only eight or 10 degrees steep. It's got a broad base, single vent in the middle from which lava flows. Um, lava slowly erupts and flows for a long time. So much so that the mountain now has reached or did reach a thousand metres high. This volcano in the picture actually erupted 9,000 years ago and created the lava that forms much of the surface of the Rift Valley around the northern end of the Thingvetia National Park, which is the ancient parliament site. Very, very famous site in Iceland. Skaldabreda isn't just any shield volcano. It's actually the volcano that led to the term shield volcano coming into use. Bit like geyser, actually. You know, the, the Iceland um, are really responsible for quite a lot of the language that we use within our tectonic lessons. Skaldabreda means broad shield, like the rather flat circular Viking shield of the early settlers to Iceland. With its round shape and central vent reminding the settlers of their shields, they named the volcano, volcano Broad Shield. And that's why we call volcanoes of this type shield volcanoes today. The formation of such a volcano has not really been studied before in real time. And so this particular eruption in the Rakens Peninsula really does offer some real insights into the working of magmatic systems. The search and rescue teams had a busy night overnight from Sunday as some people didn't heed precautions and got cold or lost on the trek. But once the weather conditions improved, high gas concentrations kept the valley closed off to all those except the scientists and workers with top standard gas monitoring equipment. They, the search and rescue teams had other work to do, however, they had sort of like time to create a safer marked path from the south coast roads that people could access the site without much of a challenge and a team of 10 staked out the route with bright poles spaced out and a helping rope to grab a one steep slope on route just before the end of the three and a half meter path. So work continued really to gain access, you know, to allow access to this particular volcano. And it started getting the name of the People's Volcano because it didn't sort of like pose much risk or damage to infrastructure and towns and villages at this particular time or to people not being an explosive um, ash volcano. Um, then it actually was considered to be the People's Volcano. 
23rd of March saw a continued steady eruption um, of a, a new volcano, a new fissure was opening, and radar data from flights over the site were used by students at the University of Iceland to map the change in landscape as the lava started to fill in the small valley. Now, when the data was collected on the lunchtime of the 23rd of March, the maximum lava thickness was now 22 metres and the cone on the slope had a height of 20 metres, 16 times smaller than the volume of um, viscous tephra emitted by Eoflecli Yerkla, which itself in volume was not a large eruption. On the graph, the red area is lava that had built up by the 20th and the orange is that that had built up after another three days. The image on the right, taken this day, shows the three active vents of the eruption that continue to emit around six cubic metres of lava per second. It's taken by Herman Helgerson, who has a few stunning Instagram images, actually, and drone videos on his reels. Um, so I'd really recommend that if you do have uh, an interest in, in gaining some really good sort of like images, in addition to the ones that are on our website from Ragnar, then have a look at Herman Helgerson. Helgerson. Um, his images really are quite fantastic. Um, one image that he took, actually, he got the drone so cl close that actually the, the drone started to melt, but he still managed to um, relay the images back. So you'll be able to see that. His Instagram account is at Hemi, H-E-M-M-I 90. Um, but we can, we can share that later um, if you wish. Um, the legendary geologist, um, an Icelandic chap um, called Pal Einarsson, he was interviewed on TV and he said, you know, whilst this eruption pipe is open and if there's enough magma underneath, there could be a long lasting eruption that forms lava shields. Um, the flow is currently just deep enough to keep the pipeline open, but it could maintain this flow. And there were examples of such flows that have kept the pipe open for decades. Um, so, you know, at this time, they actually didn't know how long this was going to last. And as the weeks went on, periods of opening and closure of the site continued, particularly when the winds were too high, making the hike dangerous or too low, causing volcanic gases to sit in the valley and not disperse. And the authorities were conscious that actually with the summer arriving, um, that would be attractive to visitors, but actually could present the most danger because of the concentrations of gas. But, they, you know, when the green light was given by the authorities, visitor numbers were high um, and the Icelanders really enjoyed the natural spectacle and tourists started to come um, to enjoy a new attraction to the capital. Now, in these photos, we can see clear evidence of flowing liquid Pahoe Hoi lava running over the top of the new lava field, with areas showing characteristics of the Aar lava with its more rubbly appearance and slow moving nature. And that's the thing that I found quite fascinating about this particular um, eruption was the different lava formations and the puddles, the pools of lava um, that started to form um, as well. And the, the volcanic eruption itself was one of the safest you can see, but it doesn't mean to say um, that it's completely safe. Um, social media started showing people that were cooking sausages on the lava. And, and perhaps this is fine if you're a scientist who understands the characteristics of the lava well and has a good safety equipment and gas monitoring. Not so wise if you're not. Um, and, you know, some people get a little bit too close in search of that perfect picture. Some photographers have lost or damaged their drones by flying them too close. And these lava puddles where you get the very thin surface lava can remelt or become covered in liquid rock that breaks through. And it's very common of this type of eruption. The photo on the left is, a short, um, is actually a short video that you can see if you Google this. It's on the um, RUV um, news website and it just shows you how quickly these puddles can appear. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I did see people stepping on the lava. Um, but it is prone to breaking. And because of the type of lava, it did have a glass-like formation. So it was quite fragile um, and, and quite sort of like difficult as well. 
So on day seven, we're only on day seven, um, and you can already see um, how things are developing. And they started to really develop the infrastructure to help with the monitoring of the eruption, but also the safety of visitors. Phone companies very quickly collaborated together to quickly establish new mobile phone masks to give a good signal. Um, and this was mainly to keep um, visitors safe. And the Met Office installed a weather station overlooking the eruption. And the data is now included to show sort of like the precise location in terms of the weather forecasting and monitoring. The rescue teams took advantage um, of a little other period of closure um, to install a people counter to look at how many people were moving both ways on the path. Um, and this was done by sensor um, to sort of like monitor the number of visitors, but also to make sure that people um, were actually quite safe um, as well. On the 25th of March, the Met Office produced their latest project of how the eruption and what they thought might happen. They thought that the lava could spread quite quickly um, and that the valley wouldn't be able to contain the lava flows. The Met Office were also at work making changes to their website. And in the UK, we're used to having a pollen forecast. And now in Iceland, that's not really necessary because there's not an awful lot of vegetation, but actually they had a gas forecast um, and it was really for um, sulfur pollution. Um, and they used this very, very long word, which I'm not even going to try, but you can see at the bottom here, Brennenstein Mengers, but it's a very catchy eight syllable word that, that I really can't um, pronounce. So lots of monitoring, lots of precautions, lots of protection being put in. The University of Iceland's um, head of natural hazard was again on the news, saying that it couldn't be promised how long the eruption would last, but they thought that it might continue. It was showing no signs of stopping. There weren't any signs of new cracks, but they really felt that the eruption could develop further along the dike that had developed in previous weeks. And they suggested that maybe some of the magma had solidified. Um, away from the zone, but actually they still thought that there was quite a lot of sort of like magma still there. Um, you know, they, they reminded people um, to look after this natural environment, to protect the, um, it, you know, keep it sustainable, protect the moss, protect the sand dunes, protect the heaths, making sure that they took litter away with them. So even though it wasn't actually erupting in any sort of significant form and people were still going to visit, um, so actually protect the landscape while it's there. Changeable weather led to quite a lot of closures on and off um, over the next couple of um, weeks. Um, you know, the people's volcano, it didn't really pose um, too much problem to the towns, the cities, the infrastructure. So it wasn't really a hazard. Um, so therefore access was always considered sort of like something that we would be able to provide for people. Um, and all sides of the valley were considered so that the access could be gained from one side if the wind direction was blowing gases down the original path. Um, and you can see here some sort of quite uh, rustic maps, I would say, started to appear um, as people were trying to put sort of like paths in place um, to allow access to this particular area. Now, on the two images on the center, we can see that two vents um, had now been created and they then combined to make a slightly lower one. The upper picture from the 24th and the lower one from the 29th, you can see the changes there. And you can see that there was a partial collapse of the volcanic cone with two vents now like two windows really at the side of the cone rather than at the top. It's also noticeable how the depth of lava has increased as the days went on, with the lava fields coming more horizontally from the vents now, rather than the longer gradient visible last, you know, in the previous weeks. In many pictures of this presentation, we've seen the bright orange colours in the lava, and the colour is a good indicator of the temperature. And the lavas that we've seen emerging in the first few ten, the first few days of the eruption, the first ten days of the eruption, show some very high temperatures. An article um, in the Icelandic press quoted a research professor from the University of Iceland as saying, "We've never seen hotter magma in Iceland." That, that emerged from the start of this eruption. 
um, which you know is quite significant because it was probably the first time that they've been able to really monitor and analyze it. There was no significant ash production and some people saw clouds and you can see some there um, above and they wondered if the eruption had changed and an ash cloud had begun, but there's not really any noticeable ash and it's not unusual on a sunny day for an eruption site with ongoing activity to cause lots of evaporation from the water from the ground, which sort of creates its own microclimate, um, which looks like an ash cloud. The eruption started to show some distinct sort of like phases in its eruption pattern. The first phase would last a couple of weeks with continuous lava flow. Second, couple of weeks with new eruptions to the, from the craters and the different um, lava flow. And this sort of like continued right the way through the summer until early September where there was a phase of fluctuating eruptions with strong lava flows and then that was interrupted by periods of inactivity. Um, the occasional lava or magma jet showed the pulsating release of ancient trap water and magma coming into contact with the groundwater. And the highest of these plumes was measured at 460 meters. Now the increase in lava flow is unusual as eruption outputs typically decrease with time. Now scientists from the University of Iceland hypothesized that this is because there was a large magma reservoir deep under the volcano, not the typical smaller magma chamber associated with these type of eruptions that empty over a short amount of, or short period of time. And from the composition of the magma sampled, they also believe that there is a discrete vent feeding the main lava flow from around about 20 kilometers down. And this may be quite more primitive than those previously sort of like seen and observed. Two defensive barriers were created um, in sort of like around about May time. And this was an experiment to stop the lava flowing into the valley where telecommunication cables were buried and also to protect the coastal road. However, the lava, the lava soon flowed over um, this barrier. So a further wall a month later, um, towards the end of June, was created. This was five metres high and 200 metres long. Um, and this was an attempt to divert the lava flow away from the infrastructure. A barrier of another barrier at the mouth of this valley was also constructed. And this did actually divert the lava um, and hopefully take a, an easier route, which eventually would flow down to the sea. Um, this was to protect some of the, the smaller villages and the infrastructure down there. There was a proposal actually to build a bridge over the road um, to allow the lava flow, um, but actually this was rejected and they considered that these barriers, which sort of like directed the lava um, away was, was actually considered to be more effective. Um, let's just look at this particular, these particular pictures here. Sorry, they show the actual um, barriers that we've seen. So around about three months after um, the volcano um, started, it had then reached an area of around about three square kilometers. And the lava had been sort of like measured at around about 100 meters deep, that's 330 feet. The lava flow became quite continuous. Um, there were some calmer um, areas as well. And as you can see from this graph here, it actually shows that there was quite a, a sort of like a systematic routine um, movement of seismic activity. When the lines actually start to rise, that was saying that the eruption was sort of like more active. Um, and when they started to fall, it would become late, least active. This graph was actually taken from August um, 2021 when there was quite a, a consistent pattern um, of when the lava was gonna happen. This top picture here, I love this picture, that shows the magma plume, um, which as we know that they're quite rare, um, but quite fascinating to see and to witness. By the end of August, the eruption had now become the second longest in Iceland of the 21st century. It stopped erupting actually for a little while on the 2nd of September, started again on the 11th of September, but it seemed that the main crater channel appeared was now blocked 
and so the crater was filled with lava from a source underneath. It was still pulsing at around about eight eruptions an hour, but no lava flowed directly out of the crater, but it seemed to come from significant amounts from outside the volcano itself. The eruption then sort of like slowly decreased and on the 18th of October, the alert was lowered from orange to yellow due to no lava having erupted since the September the 18th. The Icelandic uh, Met Office assessed that it is currently in a non-eruptive state. I think that's slightly different to active or dormant, um, but obviously the activity might escalate again, so the situation is carefully being monitored. So that gives you a timeline, um, sort of like from last year, and in comparison to the well-known and well-studied volcanic eruption of Eyjafjallajökull, the Urkla, you probably realise now that it's got very little in common. Um, the Eyjafjallajökull the Urkla eruption was an enormous explosive eruption that occurred under ice caps, producing a different range of sort of like more severe dangers. It released vast ash clouds that grounded flights, poisoned crops and triggered evacuations in the surrounding areas because of the risk of glacial floods and pyroclastic flows. Eyjafjallajökull Urkla was perhaps more sort of like a big global volcanic event um, compared to this one, but they both lend themselves to wonderful learning opportunities for the geographical classroom. And I think comparisons between the two is one of those things that really can be brought into the classroom. Um, the different lava flows, the man-made protection to divert the lava, the tourism impact, and of course, the way in which the Icelanders embrace this natural wonder of an event. Now, I was fortunate enough to visit the site last August and explore the different lava flows um, formations. And amazingly, because I was there in the middle of August, we actually did manage um, and some colleagues of mine, we did actually witness the eruption. Now, the volcano may not be active anymore. However, like its name says, it's a compound of Icelandic words, meaning um, fair or beautiful valleys and mountains. The valley and the mountains lend themselves to a lasting legacy. Um, we talk about the butterfly effects of certain events. Um, with Eyjafjallajökull, Jökla, we certainly saw this. The Icelandic tourism industry used Eyjafjallajökull to springboard tourism in Iceland, and we saw a dramatic increase of tourist visitors and financial investment. Now, this volcano is very similar, from Helge's street food to volcano tours to dramatic and wonderful walking trails. Um, this new volcano has sparked a new interest in the country at perhaps the most perfect time, as the economy was certainly suffering due to the fact that it had no visitors for over eight. 18 months. You can see there's, you know, fantastic maps, brilliant walking trails, fantastic lava fields to witness. And the uh, volcanic activity is getting tourism growing again. And it will be interesting to look back on this over sort of like the next five years to see how this again has sort of like caused this butterfly effect. You know, the, the volcanoes are as fascinating as they are threatening. And for Icelandic tourism, you know, in 2019, with nearly two million tourists landing at Keflavik Airport, in 2020, there was only half a million. Yet in mid-March, Iceland began to open itself up again. And in May 2021, there were 13 times more people travelling to Iceland than in May 2020. It would be very interesting to see what happens. Now, um, Snorri Valsen, who's from the Icelandic Tour Tourist Board, he said that, you know, he expects tourist numbers to be back up to two million this year. Very, very quick recovery, really because of the fascination of the volcano. And they have spent 900,000 euros um, on infrastructure such as paths, parking areas, toilets, cell phone towers, just around the new volcano. He said that there was no alternative. He said that, you know, we have to have marked paths. People need to be safe. Um, they need to feel safe when they're traveling. And last week it was announced that all visitors can now travel to Iceland without the need for testing and without the need for vaccination. So Iceland really is once again open for business. 
The volcano still continues to be constantly monitored. And my next few slides are really about the monitoring, the expertise, the um, planning and the management of volcanic hazards in Iceland. Equipment can be seen all around the valley, looking at the changes in height, fluctuations in gas levels, as well as the monitoring of seismic and tectonic movement. Now, many of Iceland's volcanoes exist in this way, lying dormant, careful monitoring and anticipation. There's lots of organisations involved in the monitoring. Um, the Department for Civil Protection, the Met Office doesn't just look at weather, it also looks at earthquakes um, and volcanoes as well. Um, there's ISOR, which is a not-for-profit organisation specialising in surveying the Earth's surface. You've got HS Orca, a geothermal energy company that runs a power station on the Rakens Peninsula. They're investing a lot of research into this area. And then, of course, the academics at the University of Iceland. Um, they're really looking at sort of like, you know, the, the eruptions and sharing actually their data and their expertise. Prediction and precaution also involves collaboration with other countries. Now, Iceland's not in the EU, but it has signed up to the EU's Euro Code building regulation. And Section 8 of this code sets out the minimum standards that all buildings have to comply for earthquake safety. Iceland is also a member of another EU organised project called EVE, short for European Volcano Early Warning System. It's a two year project, it's been going on since 2019. And the EU really appreciates and values Icelandic volcanic expertise. And it recognises that events such as the ash cloud from Eyjafjallajökull in 2010 do not really care whether there's a border or not. And what happens in Iceland can have a strong impact on EU countries. We don't have to look that far back in um, history to look at the eruption of Katla um, and its impacts on the French Revolution. Um, and all the crops that failed um, that actually triggered the French Revolution. So some of Iceland's volcanoes really are sort of um, quite dangerous. And if the wind's blowing in the right direction can affect many countries in Northern Europe. Now we saw, we saw during the timeline, some of the interim works that were carried out to try and divert the lava. Um, and as the lava flows expanded, um, you know, we can see here the different sort of barriers and dams that were built to try and protect the road you can see from this picture here. Um, and these were things that were really put in place. Each of the triangles on this map represents a seismograph which was located on the Rakens Peninsula in March 21. Some will be permanent. Um, and then there's also GPS um, systems that have been put in to see whether the land has shifted position and scientists can then detect um, whether or not sort of like you know they think that another eruption is going to happen or whether we're going to get more earthquakes and with so many stations the records from across the whole area can be compared to get precise information about the shaking and to remove incorrect data um, that could be um, sort of like false readings as such. There's more sensitive, um, sorry, more sensitive than GPS um, are the Sentinel satellite systems. They use high resolution imaging. And in the picture is a unit that receives the imaging data from the satellites in fixed orbit. Now these use four satellites so that data can be triangulated between them. So they are very, very accurate. And the map shown here created by the University of Iceland is from January, 2020, when earthquake activity and some movement of the magma under the mountain on Rakens called Thorbjorn caused the ground surface here to rise 60 millimetres in the space of a week. And you will see on our website um, under the Discover the World Education website, there's some fantastic resources looking at this particular magmatic movement under this mountain. Video and webcams are of course very, very powerful tools and the media outlets installed quite a lot of cameras around the Rakens um, and the images here are from the road authority, both cameras are at the same location. One's a thermal camera sensing heat um, and the other one is obviously showing the live image um, and these are monitored all the time as well. Now volcanic activity in this area doesn't usually produce a lot of ash, um, but the Met Office 
you know, they're, they're rather safe than sorry. So they've installed ash detection units um, all around the area. And gas monitoring is also very, very important because sulfur dioxide can travel very, very quickly. Um, you know, and that's something that, you know, they are monitoring all of the time. The eruption um, began on the 19th of March, as we know, but by day seven, infrastructure improvements really helped monitor the eruption and the safety. Um, you can see here the guys, that was them installing the new phone mast, and this was in seven days of the um, eruption happening. Remote sensing from planes and helicopters has informed mapping. And on the right, these are the pictures from um, the Met Office who started to carry out research just within a couple of days. It's no surprise that we, we know that it is basalt, low in silica, um, but looking at the composition, looking at the glass, we can see where this has come from. And that really can help to sort of like predict things in the future. The graphs, um, the data helps generate the graphs, plotting the growth of the eruptions, lava field changes in the rate of discharge. And this particular graph is the one that we saw before. It shows the tremor pulse rate at the volcanic site. Um, it take, it's taken from the seismometers. The high activity of the frequency of the light blue line generally indicates that the magma is rising from the crater. Um, and as I said before, we can see that it had a pretty even cycle um, in, in August, sort of every 36 to 48 hours. And using this data really helped the experts and the tourists know when it was a good time to visit if they really wanted to see the eruption happen. We know that the Met Office produced maps of how they expected the lava flows to develop. And they also began to include these sulfur pollution forecasts, like I said about sort of like, you know, the we have the pollen forecasts. And this map from the University of Iceland uses the EVE data. It shows the likelihood of lava flow in the active areas of the Rakens, and it helps the authorities decide whether or not certain paths or rows need to be closed off. So, you know, in terms of the atmosphere to the left, we've got the potential movement and areas such as the International Airport and the capital city were really closely monitored in terms of the gas and the ash movement. And there might have been some need to consider the ash forecast um, for residents. The idea of taking precautions is that you can remove or reduce the risk involved. We cannot prevent earthquakes or volcanic eruptions, but what we can do is reduce the impact. And I'm sure that you've seen throughout sort of like the last 45, 50 minutes or so, um, actually the, um, the responsibility of managing the response to this um, natural hazard in Iceland was really taken very, very seriously. There was lots of televised press conferences, people were told not to visit, roads were closed, parents were advised to openly discuss the seismic and volcanic activity with children so that they don't rely on social media for things that can be misread or misinterpreted. Even the scientists were advised not to get sort of like carried away. Everything had to be clear, factual and concise. Each hazardous area in Iceland has its own risk assessment created by the Civil Protection Authority. And you can see some of these and you'll be able to explore some of these by looking on the websites. All the hotels have to have emergency and evacuation plans and they have to be shared with the Civil Protection Authority. On the right, you can see a section from the Northern Light Inn on the Rakens Peninsula, which includes a coach company that's always on standby to evacuate those guests that don't have a car. And they even have a backup line um, that if the phone lines are down to that coach company um, so that they can get people out nice and quickly. In some situations, it's not always quick and easy to evacuate people. So um, during this particular eruption, the earthquake activity and heightened risk sort of like led to people having text messages and pe things were sort of closed just in preparation, just in case. Um, people are well aware um, as to what happens um, in an eruption and they really do prepare their communities to take precautions just in case. Um, as well as Icelandic, they also publish the advice in English and Polish. 
Um, and everything is available for people to see. Much of the advice is common sense, but if an eruption did begin, calm reminders of basic advice are very, very important. It's coordinated by the Met Office. Um, all the volcanic systems in Iceland are part of a colour-coded aviation warning system. Red was used in 2010 for Eiffel Lyökla as ash was um, affecting. The coding is updated daily, but more quickly if needed. Now here we can see a police enforcing notice from the civil protection. It closed the road as a tremor pulse was getting underway. Um, we can see rescue teams in red who were sent out to check for anyone who might be in the area. And if something significant happened, an emergency tech systems means that anybody and everybody with a phone, Icelandic or foreign, gets a text message which is written in many languages. And the text comes through from the emergency response number 112. In this photo, this rescue worker's jacket is a gas meter to provide data to scientists, but more importantly, to sound the alarm if the workers enter area with hazardous gas emissions. Now, with regards to that text from 112, I actually received one of these in August 21, which doesn't surprise me because I wasn't on the volcano. But actually, we were in Iceland just a couple of weeks ago and I was quite close to the volcano Hekla. Um, I was driving along road one. Um, it's one of Iceland's heightened watched volcano. And I just got a text message to say, you're in a heightened watch area. Just keep your eye out for warnings and, and stuff like that. So it's a really, really good system. Um, as we can see here, safetravel.is and Christian Jones Dottier from the, the Met Office, the Natural Hazards, you know, they were encouraging people to go to the volcano, the people's volcano, but to take sort of like, you know, very effective precautions and preparation before going there. So I hope that that has given you lots and lots of information. Um, it's quite a detailed case study at the moment. It is an unnamed volcano. Um, I know I've given you a lot of information, um, but hopefully you can cherry pick what you would like to use for your students and then use some of that information within our resource pack that you will be able to find um, on our website. I've put the link up there. It's very easy to find. You go on to Discover the World Education and then you look under Teacher Resources and you will find this particular resource pack as well as lots of the images that I have shared with you this evening. You will also find um, within our website two um, previous presentations and webinars, Iceland and Wakes and Iceland Erupts. Both of those webinars um, were presented by my colleague Simon Wells um, and they were actually live webinars in March and April last year so they really looked at what was happening in real time. Um, I want to say thank you to you all for joining me this evening, um, but also to the partners of Discover the World, the friends of photographers and the authorities who've offered their views and permission to use the images and data in this webinar, particularly to Simon, who's um, really supported me with the completion of this presentation. Um, many of the slides, information, graphs, photographs, data analysis um, came from um, his research as well. So thank you to him. Um, please do use our resource pack. You can watch this video again. It will be um, downloaded onto our YouTube channel as well as being accessible um, through our website. As I said before, Iceland is now fully open for all passengers. So if you did want to go and explore um, the new volcano um, or take your students out there to visit this um, amazing country, please do contact me and I'll guide and support you with um, booking your trip. And thank you very much again for your interest and for joining us on this presentation. Take care, thank you. Thank you.